Um, I'm here to talk about the state of federal politics uh, in this election year. So if you thought that um, Susan's speech was depressing, wait till you get to the end of this one. Um, <laughs> Where do I start? I, I, I might start with a, a little bit of a lament. I feel like this is more of a, a group therapy session, quite frankly, uh, rather than a, a commentary on the state of politics. But we're obviously in an election year. There's some debate about whether the government will go to the polls early or not. And by early, we now mean July, rather than leave it till the second half of the year or the very end of the year, I should say. Um, to do so, the difficulty for them, uh, just by way of an introduction to this, because Christopher Pine has been spruiking this for some reason, uh, the difficulty for them is that they would literally have to call the election, if my maths is right, the day after the federal budget. Now, they may choose to do that, uh, but one of the difficulties of that, of course, is that they would be seen, I believe, to be sort of, in a sense, trying to take advantage of the situation or avoiding the opposition leader's right of reply two days later. There are risks in it that it looks overtly political. And over here in WA, everyone would well remember, in my view at least, uh, the damage that Alan Carpenter did to himself when he called an early election to try to take advantage of problems on the Liberal side. His great strength was that he was seen as above politics and not your typical politician. When he tried to take advantage of the leadership changeover to Colin Barnett, uh, I think a lot of people in the public saw that as him actually morphing into a politician uh, right at a time where people had had enough of politicians. And of course, Colin Barnett, not so much now, but then uh, didn't look like your typical politician. He very much looked uh, like the anti-politician because he was on his way out. So I think that there are risks there uh, if there is to be an early election called immediately after the budget for Malcolm Turnbull. Although in a sense, we've already started to see him facing a lot of the, these problems uh, even in the short period since the return of Parliament this year. I'll talk a little bit about uh, the end of the, the Malcolm Turnbull honeymoon, but also why uh, Malcolm Turnbull could almost go down in a screaming heap and he'd still be a preferred electoral option to Tony Abbott. So there's, there's still reasons for Liberals to be joyous, uh, just perhaps not as joyous as they'd hoped to be uh, at, the end of, at the end of last year. And the state of modern politics, though, uh, if you can indulge me on this, it's a little bit off topic specifically about what to expect on the election campaign trail this year. But the, the state of modern politics, certainly in the federal sphere, I think, uh, is the thing that is most depressing and most problematic uh, for anyone that is looking for serious reform debates. Uh, there's a little bit of exceptionalism, almost surprisingly, uh, on the Labor side with them putting forward some policies, the latest one being their negative gearing policy, which I'll come to later. But uh, the problem, I think, with modern politics is, is everyone's problem. Uh, it's a problem of the political class themselves, which I'll talk a little bit about, uh, with the exception, of course, of our honourable guests here today. Uh, and it's also a problem uh, for you, the voters, with the exception of, of course, all of you here today as well. Uh, the, the voting public today is very much part of a throwaway generation, a throwaway culture. Uh, if your microwave breaks down, you get rid of it. If your fridge breaks down, you get rid of it. Uh, that, I think, has morphed into the political sphere. If your politician breaks down, just get rid of him or her, uh, rather than give them a chance to repair themselves. Once upon a time, there was a lot more repair in politics, and it wasn't necessarily on the run, but it was while they were in office. These days, it feels like we're less uh, forgiving about the political class. And that includes journalists and commentators. They're not absolved from it. Uh, I remind you I'm an academic whenever I talk about journalists and commentators being part of the problem, not the solution. Um, if we feel like we're listening to Dr Warren, though, and academia isn't doing enough, then I'm a journalist. Uh, but I, I do think that all three aspects uh, have problems. The voters have become, in a sense, more selfish uh, and less in tune with um, what a lot of people that are a little bit older would recognise about the difficulties of, of previous economically tough times. Uh, and the voters do have much more of an attitude uh, of what can the political class do for us, rather than necessarily what is in the best interests of us via uh, the, the macro setting uh, of, of where the country's at. That is an issue. Uh, journalism, I think, in, in the era of 24-hour news uh, and in the era of journalism almost being a conduit for a lot of journalists uh, to a career in corporate affairs where they can make a lot more money, I think that's become a problem as well. Uh, the gotcha type of journalism where there is more space to fill uh, even as the mainstream media falls away, I think there's a real issue there as it becomes more of a reporting of the soap opera. And the political class themselves, I think, are a problem uh, insofar as the professionalisation of it has almost become uh, its, 
it, it's it's difficult. Once upon a time, you only had uh, you know sort of the best of the best, if I could put it that way, or the most senior uh, of party organisational types or staffing types that would go into politics. And you need that. You need to have these professionals to remind uh, perhaps the more idealistic or those that might come in from a different direction, the so-called star candidates, uh, to remind them of what was politically realistic or politically possible. These days, I think it's almost become its own franchise. Uh, politics now is very much a case of if you want to be a politician, uh, unless you're the exception to the rule, uh, you need to go through the training of, uh, within the Labor Party and the Liberal Party, time in staffing, or perhaps uh, on top of that, uh, in the case of the Labor Party, where once they drew from a broad range of people coming from union official backgrounds, I would argue now that union official backgrounds aren't as much from the factory floor as they once were, so you don't have that diversity within the working class. On the Liberal side, because people are coming from staffing backgrounds, they're not as diverse from the middle class or the business class. So you've, you've got an overall sort of narrowing of the gene pool in Parliament. And I think that contributes uh, to politics for the sake of politics and the idea that we're in this to get re-elected rather than we're wanting to get re-elected to achieve X, Y and Z. And I do think that that's a real problem. Uh, so this being an election year, uh, that's worth reflecting on and perhaps uh, is an interesting marker for me to get back on topic which is to say that Malcolm Turnbull has already started to look like he's been infected by this. Uh, a lot of people thought, uh, whether you agreed or disagreed with the policy scripts that he might pursue, they thought that he would go after major tax reform. Uh, they thought that he would go after major federation reform. Perhaps even do the latter first, because you can't have proper tax reform without first reforming the federation and getting the tax mix between the Commonwealth and the states right. All of that looked like, at the end of last year, it would be on the agenda this year. Uh, and if you talk to Scott Morrison, it probably looked like it was on the agenda just a couple of weeks ago. Um, but he wasn't. He obviously didn't get the memo uh, from the PMO that, uh, that they were shutting this one down. So the government, in my opinion at least, uh, has become, or it became hostage to its own popularity and the effort, politically speaking, this year to try to reflect that in the result of the election later this year. Uh, and it became a self-fulfilling prophecy that it actually started to lose some of that political edge. We saw the news poll show that it's back to 50-50. I'm not sure it's as tight as that. Uh, I wouldn't go as far as uh, the Honourable Gary Gray, who's present today, to say that his party has no chance of winning. Uh, I'm being unfair, he didn't quite put it like that. But uh, I, I do think that the coalition are comfortably the favourites to win the election. I just think it'll end up being a fairly pyrrhic victory because they're likely to, in a sense, have their own version of the mistake that... Uh, Tony Abbott made when he won the last election. He couldn't have lost that election, this is different, but he couldn't have lost that election uh, and therefore he should have laid out his plans of exactly what he wanted to do beyond stopping the boats and so forth. Uh, but he didn't do that. He won, he won with a thumping majority and then the voters felt somewhat surprised, uh, even though a lot of people in this room might not have been that surprised by what he then laid out uh, at the budget and thereafter. And modern politics, I think, doesn't have as much forgiveness for the politician that is perceived to break promises. And one byproduct of the professionalisation of modern politics, I think, also creates a scenario where the opposition is better at its job, uh, even though the life and the difficulties of the government have become more apparent, the difficulties and the problems that they face. So if Malcolm Turnbull thinks that he can win the next election by playing a smallish target game, and then look to do more after it once he's got the mandate that he thinks he needs, not so much from the, you, the voter, but for the sake of controlling his right flank, uh, who are still upset about what happened to Tony Abbott, uh, I think he's mistaken, because I think electorally he would then find himself in the, in the second term of a coalition government facing all the recycled problems that Tony Abbott faced when he was seen to have broken promises and gone on a policy script that wasn't laid out to the voters. Uh, so the interesting thing for 2016 is to watch just where does this government go in terms of its policy agenda from here. They've ruled out uh, the GST. Uh, as I understand it, the federation reform um, white paper as well as broader debate is something that uh, was inherited with little attached to it uh, when Malcolm Turnbull moved into the prime ministership. And as I said earlier, I think that's what needs to come first if they're serious about any form of tax reform. But with the GST off the table, uh, the government is really hampered in how it can change the tax mix. Uh, I went into the political overview that I wrote for CETA uh, last year just to check how wrong I was just a matter of months later. Um, it's a dangerous business to ask somebody to write that who predicted that there was no way Malcolm Turnbull would come back. Uh, and there was certainly no way that 
Kevin Rudd would ever come back to the Prime Ministership either. So it's with those words that I say I'm absolutely confident that Tony Abbott won't be coming back um, to the Prime Ministership of this country. Uh, more confident than I've ever been before, because that, that stands for a lot. Uh, I, I think... I think the, the, the difficulty for the government now is that they're going to be fiddling around the edges, uh, having made the economy the central message for rolling Tony Abbott and replacing him with Malcolm Turnbull in Malcolm Turnbull's own words on the day of the coup and having prescribed themselves so much sort of hope and anticipation that they would achieve a lot uh, in the tax reform space as well as elsewhere, they're now left in a situation where without major change from or two, more consumption tax and less income tax just as, as part of it, uh, they can't really do all the other elements uh, in as easy a way. And on top of that, uh, they're now trying to play politics against Labor's scheme on negative gearing. Uh, and there's a real internal debate going on, as, as most of you would realise, within the coalition ranks about how to try uh, to combat Labor's negative gearing policy. I've already uh, written saying that I, I'm generally speaking in favour of the broad terms of what Labor is trying to do in the negative gearing space, not with my infinite knowledge of economics, but because I outsource my understanding of economics to whatever Saul Eslake says, uh, and he thinks it's a good idea. So generally speaking, the, the, the challenge then becomes for the government uh, how it handles, or sorry, for the opposition, how it handles the government scare campaign. But what an ironic situation that we're in. 2016 now looks like it's going to be a scare campaign election, not Labor scaring on the GST, because that's now off the table, uh, but rather Malcolm Turnbull trying to scare about Labor's negative gearing policy. The problem, though, uh, is that Dr Warren is right. Malcolm Turnbull uh, wants to embrace innovation. He wants to embrace hope. He's a positivist fundamentally in his style. He's not Mr Negative. Um, now, I'm trying to think who is uh, a good negative campaigner that the coalition might have had uh, for the 2016 election. Uh, I'm not sure he was popular enough to carry the day, but... I don't see Malcolm Turnbull uh, prosecuting as effective a negative campaign against Labor's negative gearing policy as a Tony Abbott might have been capable of doing. Uh, and it will be interesting to see how he tries to do that at the same time as knowing that he has a natural predilection towards trying to also do something about negative gearing. And that's a policy space where the government at the moment uh, is really trying to find its feet on. Into that mix for this election year, you throw the natural tendencies that exist on the government side in relation to the conservative wing of the party, uh, as well as the more moderate wing of the party. Uh, there was always going to be tensions there, no matter how a leadership transfer happened, or indeed if one didn't occur. Um, but as Labor would well know uh, from its previous six years in government, there is no such thing as the smooth coup against a prime minister. Uh, and whilst uh, I am supremely confident that Tony Abbott isn't coming back, uh, I'm also supremely confident that his um, small band of supporters um, and he, the larger grouping of conservatives within the Liberal Party uh, that are trying to maintain a sort of ideological control of the party, that they will be prepared in an election year uh, to cause problems. And they've already started to show that. Uh, part of that comes from the fact that they take the view, as I understand it, uh, that they are likely to win this election. It's a matter of how they win it. Uh, and there is a concern in some conservative quarters of the Liberal Party uh, that a big victory for Malcolm Turnbull, even on a small agenda, uh, would solidify him and solidify that factional side of the party internally for an aftermath of an election. And that worries conservatives because the Liberal Party has, despite its name, largely been controlled by the conservative wing of the Liberal Party. And John Howard used to say, I can't remember if this was off or on the record, but John Howard used to say um, that the Liberal Party has to be a broad church, but the Conservatives must always be the dominant force within the broad church. Well, the rise and rise of Malcolm Turnbull, if it continues, as well as his coterie of supporters, uh, perhaps puts that at some risk. Uh, and that is actually an undercurrent in this election year, quite away uh, from the policy debates that we're likely to see. Uh, the early signs uh, for this election year are very much that the opposition, not the government, is going to make the run-in on policy. And then the big question becomes, uh, do they get unpicked because of the nature of modern politics? Um, I tend to think that there will be enough stumbles on the way through for Labor as it has a larger policy platform than the government. And I think that will continue despite what we see unveiled in the May budget. The danger for Labor is that there will be enough problems um, also in the wake of only having been in opposition for one term, to deliver a benefit of the doubt result for the government and a win 
I just, my fear is that it's a win uh, with little by way of an agenda and therefore um, Malcolm Turnbull, uh, like it or not, sort of uh, is on his way to becoming what I think Tony Abbott may have also been on his way to becoming, which is the next Malcolm Fraser in terms of not actually achieving the kind of reforms um, that perhaps that side of politics might think that it should. And then the question, which is the more interesting one, maybe one for years down the track, uh, is does the Labor Party have it within itself to find a Hawke or a Keating style figure to overtake that particular government that didn't live up to expectations, just as the previous Labor government didn't, uh, to get us back on track. And, and that's where I continue to be depressed um, in, in a general sense, because I don't see the answers to that. I'm almost out of time, two minutes, but just a very quick comment uh, on Senate reform. Uh, I think that Senate reform is going to be interesting to watch, both for how it stifles debate ahead of it happening, um, because the crossbenchers are none too happy uh, about getting wiped out by a, a deal between the Greens and the Liberals. How ironic is that? Um, but on top of that, I think that there are unintended consequences uh, for the government in this. Uh, I'm surprised that Labor didn't back the policy package at one level because I would have thought a permanent Greens balance of power in the upper house as a long-term outcome would be better for Labor than for the conservative side of politics. Uh, however, their concern, I think, uh, is one of if you wipe out the need for preference arrangements in the upper house, then the Greens don't have to give preferences to Labor in the lower house, and that could really hurt the Labor Party in key marginal seats. Uh, I suspect that might have been one of the factors that won the day, but I haven't had a leak out of shadow cabinet to know for sure. Um, on, the, on the Liberal side, I think they need to be careful of the laws of unintended consequences in the long term, and this in a sense becomes emblematic of what is wrong with modern politics. I really believe that the Senate reforms, as much as most of us are quite happy to get rid of the Jackie Lambies of this world from Parliament, perhaps except for journalists. Uh, one of the issues, one of the issues of major Senate reform that has been looked at in the current model is I do think it entrenches the Greens as a third force. Xenophon will be there for a while, but a party named after yourself doesn't usually go that far after you leave Parliament yourself. So if Xenophon's party is fleeting, uh, and the Greens have the permanent balance of power in the upper house as a result of these reforms, uh, in the long term, you'd have to ask why are the Liberals so supportive of this? Um, the answer takes me back to my original depression at the start of this talk, uh, which is that politicians these days don't think for the long term as much as they probably should. They think short term, they think winning the next election, uh, even if they won't have much of a mandate to do much with it, uh, which is where I conclude. I, I see Malcolm Turnbull winning this election year, I predict that as confidently as I have all my previous predictions, um, but I don't see him doing it with the kind of policy mandate that looked like would be the case last year um, and or that will be spruiked as being the case after the May budget. So I see it very much as a pyrrhic victory to the coalition uh, for a, an emulating uh, of the Fraser years as we all hang on and wait uh, for our next Bob Hawke, Paul Keating or John Howard. Thank you.